Ephesians 2 verse 1 to 22. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you, who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross which by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So Jody kicked us off with a brand new series last week, a new six week series that we're doing as Restore. And we're taking it from the book of Ephesians and we've called the series Reframe, hence all the frames around me. Um, this year has been quite an extraordinary year, hasn't it? Um, in every way possible, uh, not only with a coronavirus uh, outbreak, but also uh, now with the racial tensions and the whole way that that has exploded something into our attention and uh, onto our streets as well, something that we need to pay attention to. And we had a real sense that in this season maybe God has got our attention because he wants us to change the way that we look at the world and uh, to uh, maybe bring some things into focus that we hadn't seen clearly before and so we felt that we would use the book of Ephesians and work through it as an opportunity to get God's perspective because obviously we can reframe but sometimes when we reframe we reframe out of our own hurt or our own pain or out of our own history but in this season I think we need to take ourselves back to the word of God and make sure that if we do gain a fresh perspective on life, that the way that we do that is by tuning into God and by listening to his word. And so Jodie started uh, off the series last week and uh, she used a couple of buzz phrases that I'm sure you will remember. So she talked about the fact that all of God has been working through all of history to save all of us. And she also talked about uh, God's grace and she talked about the word grace uh, standing for God's rescue at Christ's expense. And Jody was talking about the big picture of everything that God has come to do for us in Jesus. And the first half of the book of Ephesians, chapters one to three, talk about all of the completed work of Christ. And so 27 times it mentions either in Christ or in him. And so the focus is everything that has been won for us 
in Jesus. And then it moves on to some very practical stuff. So we get down to the nitty gritty in terms of how that affects our everyday relationships, how that affects our parenting, how that affects our marriages, how that affects our behavior at work. And then it ends with how we need to take authority over the enemy and see him defeated. And so we're going to work through uh, the whole of the book of Ephesians over these six weeks. But today we're going to move on to Ephesians chapter two. So if Jody looked at the big picture, which is what Ephesians chapter one talks about. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about reframing humanity and getting a fresh perspective on how God wants humanity to exist and to coexist. And if ever there was a time that we need to tune into this and maybe get some realignment so we can help society to realign, it's now. And Ephesians chapter 2 is a really easy chapter to uh, uh, work out because it falls into two parts. You get verses one to 10, which is all about reframing as an individual. And so it's about getting God's perspective on me as an individual person. And then the second half of the chapter from verse 11 through to verse 22 is about reframing as a community. So to begin with, Paul talks about the new person that we become in Christ. And then he moves on to talk about the new people that we become in Christ. And it's a connected journey because we're made to be together. If you remember in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, in Genesis chapter 1, there's all the things that are good that God makes. And then in Genesis chapter 2, for the first time, we get something that is not good. And the first thing that God says is not good is for man to live alone. And so the first half of this chapter flows into the second half of this chapter. And you have to connect the two because we're meant to be a together people. So we bring our new identity in Christ into our new togetherness in Christ. And we're going to look at those two halves this morning. Um, What's also interesting in the two halves is it starts off, Paul starts off with a description of what life is like outside of Jesus. And then you get a verse that says, but... And the but is where God breaks in and brings a change and a transformation. And then Paul moves on to describe the new that we've received in Jesus. So it's a really, really simple structure to follow. I like simple structures because I can follow them then. So it's a really simple structure to follow. And so we're going to begin by looking at reframing our individual identity and our individual personhood. And uh, this uh, goes from, as I say, verse 1 through to verse 10. And it culminates in our memory verse for today. I hope you tuned in at 10.20 for the family slot. The machines were fantastic. Next week, we've got the Pierce household. So that's a little bit crazy, but a lot of fun as well. So do tune in. And our kids aren't in that uh, category, really, that age group that we're aiming towards. But I tune in anyway because I love it. It's so much fun. So tune in at 10.20 for the new family time. But if you tuned in this morning, you will have got the memory verse, which is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which talks about the fact that we are God's workmanship, or as Rebecca uh, uh, interpreted this morning, we are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as the kids told us this morning, when God made us and he looked at us, he said, wow, you're amazing. Do you know this morning, God speaks over each and every one of us and he says, wow, you're amazing. And I don't know who else you've had historically who's delivered some kind of verdict over your life. You know, the one that really counts is the verdict of your heavenly father. And he says, wow, you're amazing. And Paul starts off the chapter by saying what life is like outside of Jesus. And he talks about the fact that we were dead. And it uh, it says we were dead in our sins and in our transgressions. And uh, they seem like big religious-y sort of words. But transgressions just means to cross a boundary that you shouldn't. And sin is actually an archery term, and it means to miss the mark or to miss the target, a bit like me if I tried to uh, play uh, uh, being an archer this morning. And so what it basically says is it says, if you don't root yourself in Jesus, you end up crossing boundaries that aren't good, and you end up falling short of who God wants you to be. And that leaves you in a place that you feel dead inside. In fact, Paul says, we just walk according to the way of the world. And that's the story, that's the history that many of us have experienced. And actually, it's a lonely place to be, and it's a painful place to be, and it's often a place where we end up in hurt. But the good news 
is that because God has been working in all of time to reach all of us, then we get to verse 4, which says, but, but God breaks in. And so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 says, but because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. And the thing is, when you invite Jesus into your life, something changes and something changes at the core of who we are. And we're able to leave behind the old. We're able to leave behind our falling short. We're able to leave behind our history and our brokenness. And we're able to step back into knowing that we are God's masterpiece. And we can hear our Heavenly Father speak over us, you're so loved. And you can hear your Heavenly Father speak over you and say, wow, you're amazing. And Paul uses three verses when he, three verbs in the next verses when he talks about the transformation. He says, we're made alive. He says, we're raised up. And he says, we're seated with Jesus. And so when we come to Jesus, it's like God's love starts to break out in us and we find a new sense of purpose. So John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life in, in, in all its fullness. So when we open up ourselves to Jesus, his life comes into us and we start to spark with the life of God. And then it says that we're raised up. And so we're lifted out of our history. We're lifted out of our pain. We're lifted out of our brokenness. We're lifted out of the things that have gone wrong, our falling short. And we're lifted into a whole new life. And then Paul says we're seated together with Christ. And so God moves by his spirit to make us more like Jesus. And what Paul then says is he says, and all of this is grace. It's God's free gift to you. He says you haven't earned it. In fact, there's nothing you can do to earn it. It is just the most wonderful, incredible love gift from your heavenly father to you. This morning, maybe you just need to receive that love gift afresh. Maybe you just need to receive the fact that I am loved by God because I'm God's masterpiece. And he says, wow, over me. And there's a picture that we use often when we talk about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 in our Living Free course. And it's a picture that we found of a masterpiece that was originally found when it was in ruins. And then uh, some people worked on it and they bought some restoration and uh, made it new again. And so if you want to put that slide up, Alex, then that's how it was found on the left when it was first discovered. And then after some people worked on it, it became the picture on the right because God restored it. And for many of us, we felt cut and we found like we, our history has been one of disappointment and that we're less than what God wants us to be. But the good news is he's working by his spirit to love out and to draw out the masterpiece that he made us to be. And just as uh, my fingerprint is unique, just as my personality is unique, just as my giftings are unique, God made me uniquely special and loved by him. And my uniqueness is what he delights over. And as he does that over me, so he does that over you. And one of the things we do in our Living Free course is we take a moment for everyone who comes on it and we pray for them and we ask that God will show us who he made us to be. And uh, when we do that, we ask God to open our ears to hear what it is he delights about the people that we pray for. So there's no room for negativity. There's no room for, you know, God made you wonderful, but th there's no room for any of those things. It is just uh, pictures and words about how God celebrates who we are and the uniqueness that he put within us. And I thought, you know, I like a bit of interaction on a Sunday morning. I like the opportunity to, to go live and to be in a situation that anything can happen. Um, and so over the next few minutes, anything could happen. But I was going to invite Michelle and Nathan to come up here and stand at a socially distanced uh, <laughs> space away from me. I'd like us to do some live original design prayer for uh, Michelle and Nathan. So we believe as a church, anyone can hear from God. In fact, everyone can hear from God. All you have to do is ask God to speak. And because he's a good father, he loves 
to speak to us. Often, to me, he just gives me a little sense of something, or uh, maybe in my mind, a little impression of something. And we're going to pray for Michelle and Nathan. And if you get a sense of, this is who I think God's called them to be. This is who God's made them to be. If you write it down, put it on the live stream, then I'm going to be able to receive it here. And I'm going to uh, share it with Michelle and Nathan. And we're also going to compile it and uh, give it to them after the service as well, just as an act of blessing. So let's pray together. And let's let God speak. Father, I thank you for Michelle and Nathan. Lord, I thank you for the James family. And thank you that every member of this family is unique, is a masterpiece made by you. And thank you that when you see them, you say, wow. And Father, as your people, Lord, we want to be a community that loves them and that builds them up and speaks out your heart for them. And so, Lord, in these moments, I pray that you'll speak to us. I pray that you give us speak scriptures pray that you give us words uh, pray father you'll give us uh, pictures encouragements that we can speak out about the uniqueness of who you've made them to be in jesus name amen and so whatever you get if you put it on the chat stream obviously if it's for uh, nathan you might want to put an n before it for michelle you want, might want to put an m in front of that as well um, i got some people praying a little bit earlier so i've got some stuff to uh, kick you off with so um, this is from Helen Finney, and she says, Nathan, um, as she saw you, she immediately saw a fire hose, and she felt that God's designed you to be able to put out fires. She felt that he's made you really reliable, and that wherever you go, you bring peace. She felt he's made you sensible um, and gives you practical words which calm down fires. Mm. She also had a sense that he's put a real inner strength in you that can contain the power of the water that flows through you, that God's designed you to, to be full of Holy Spirit power and you have the wisdom to direct it where it's needed most. She also sensed that, he, um, that you're designed to work well in a team, that a fire hose works best on a fire truck uh, and with all the other tools around you. So God's designed you to work well in team. This is great because I've just lost my peace. Oh, see, I shouldn't make jokes about um, going live on a Sunday morning, should I? So Helen got some stuff for Michelle as well and felt God's designed you with a smile that cuts through people's barriers and reaches to their heart. That you're a nurturer, not just for your own family, but in a spiritual directing way. And that God's designed you with strong com compassion for what is right and he's given you a voice not just in worship and singing, although I had a picture of you on a street corner, and as you were singing, it was releasing life and colour. I'm going to struggle now because I can't stand with people. <laughs> um, and that God trusts you to use words clearly and with authority. And Helen also had a sense that God's designed you with a joyful heart and given you real discernment. And he's designed you to have the ability to hear words and to be able to put them to music. Mm. Two other words. Um, so for Nathan, um, this is from Jonathan Finney. Um, Jonathan got the sense that you're straight and true, that there's no guile in you. Guile's an unusual word to use, but that means there's nothing deceitful about you, nothing dishonest about you. And he was reminded that it's the same thing that Jesus spoke about Nathaniel in the Bible. Mm. And then he realised that Nathan's short for Nathaniel. <laughs> so that felt like it might be God. And, uh, and for Michelle, Jonathan had a picture of a, of a sunflower that was very bright and that was beaming. And it was reflecting the sun and it was standing above all the other flowers. And that nothing gets in the way of the sun reaching the sunflower. And he felt that God's made you to be one who soaks in God's love and care and you radiate colour and light to others. So it's great, isn't it? Now, it's great just taking a moment to bless people and make them cry um, in front of people is great. So I'm going to see if we've got some other stuff that's coming on the live stream now. Uh, let's see. Um, Matt Chow. Hi, Matt. Uh, good to have you uh, uh, online today. Um, Matt says, Michelle, um, God's made you like a gem, a diamond, and he treasures you deeply. Um, Ricarda has sent in, hi Ricarda, um, that he's made you to be a voice of hope wow. and he's made you, Nathan, to be a conqueror. Wow. Oh, there's loads coming in now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michelle, you're designed to bring light and life. You're caring and compassionate and able to stand with people as a true friend in an unthreatening way. 
Uh, Michelle, this is from Mookie. Hi, Mookie. You're a beam of light. You cut through the dark that people see and feel warm and welcome in your presence. You light up the space you're in. You light up and highlight the goodness and greatness of people. You're a beam of light like an activator. Just, flower need, just as a flower needs light to grow, you bring that light and it pours out of you. And for Nathan, uh, a picture of a cat from the Nordens. I won't comment on that. See, a picture of a cat with claws climbing up a tree, able to hold on where others can't hold on anymore. And so a real strength of, of grip there. Um, from, uh, this is from Tony. It's good to pray for you this morning, Tony. It's good for you to be praying for uh, Michelle and Nathan as well. Um, I believe, Michelle, you've been anointed by God for such a time as this. There'll come a time when the Lord gives you your own songs because of your heart for God. And Nathan, I see a huge mountain with snow at the peak. You're someone with a strong foundation with God and you'll be great to support other people around you. And, uh, and again, um, for you, Nathan... Um, I've seen the humble spirit of Nathan. He'll be raised to reach many of his friends and lead them to Jesus. Something I believe that you've been praying for. And another picture from Juliet. Hi, Juliet. Uh, we're looking after your family well here on a Sunday morning. Um, and they're looking after us well as well. Saw a picture of a builder, someone who's creative and who brings the team of builders together with kindness, working together to create new things. And Willem... Willem Hammond, he's one of our kids, which is great, all ages, contributing, hearing from God. Willem sees a picture of a radiator for you, Nathan, and you're one who gives warmth and brings warmth to people around you. And I think there's something about safety yeah. in that and comfort in that as well. And uh, Catherine Wait, hi, Catherine. Um, God's made you sturdy and deeply rooted so that others can lean on you and know safety and peace. And another one for you, Nathan, you're strong, <laughs> stable, yeah. and a beacon. You're not shaken when things look uncertain and stormy. And uh, I'll do one more for, for you, Michelle, from Lani. You look for goodness below the surface. You know that it's there, and you can follow God's lead, even in the dark. So we've got people who are transcribing all of these words. They're going to put them into a document and we'll send them to you afterwards because it's what God's speaking about the wow that he sees in both of you. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Good. <laughs> Love it. One of the reasons I wanted to do that this morning live is, is not just to show that actually it's really easy to hear from God, but also to, to show us how amazing it is when we take a little bit of time to reframe things and see them from God's perspective instead of from our perspective. And it's actually a really powerful thing. It, it's not unusual for someone to cry like Michelle did because it's really powerful to hear words of blessing that we speak to one another. And if that's how God has made us to be, then actually as a new humanity together as God's people, we need to be a community who draw that out of one another and love that out of one another. And so the first half of Ephesians chapter two is just rediscovering the fact that we are made by God and wonderfully made by God, and that he says, wow, and loves us very much. And then it moves on to how we treat one another in God's new humanity together as God's people. And what's interesting in this is uh, the city of Ephesus was in modern day Turkey. And so that was in the Gentile region of the world. Now, from a Jewish perspective, there were uh, two nations really in the world um, at the time of Jesus. There was the Jews, God chosen people, and there was everyone else. And the Jews were God-chosen people, so they had, as we might put it in modern language, they had Jewish privilege. And everyone else was less than being a Jew. And they had a collective term for all of them, and they called them Gentiles. And so the Ephesian church actually felt looked down upon, and they felt excluded by their Jewish brothers and that's what Paul then addresses in the second half of the chapter. And in verses 11 to 12, he uses seven words that all talk about exclusion. 
Now, in the Bible, the word seven uh, stands for completion. That's why the seven acts of love that the father does for the son in the prodigal son story, the seven acts of love that the good Samaritan does for the injured person. And here, the seven words of exclusion, because it's a complete exclusion. And the words that he uh, uses there are the words Gentile, uncircumcised, separate, excluded, foreigners, without hope, and without God. And Paul addresses these things because it breaks his heart for any nation or people group to feel like that. And over the last couple of weeks, I think I and some of us have begin, begun to feel afresh God's heartbreak for the oppression and the exclusion that the black community have felt around the world, but also in the UK. And Jesus came to bring a change to that. And as we move on in the second half of Ephesians 2, we get a second, but God, but God breaks in. And that's in verse 14. And this is a, a wonderful work, a wonderful verse about the work of Jesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Jesus. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, that's a very powerful word, isn't it? A very powerful verse. But it says that Jesus came to break down every wall of hostility between people and to bring reconciliation into one community where everyone knows that they're God's masterpiece and he's speaking wow over them. And our work as the body of Christ, as Jesus's body, is to embrace that and to work together so we see every dividing wall torn down, whether that's a dividing wall of anger and unforgiveness, whether it's a social or economic wall, or whether it's a racial prejudice wall, God has called us to break it down and bring harmony. I used to live in southeast London in a, in a place called Downham. And uh, Downham was a, a government-built estate, so an old-fashioned council estate. And it, in effect, uh, linked the community of Downham to Bromley. And when it was built in the 1930s, the residents of Bromley didn't like the idea of it. So they clubbed together. This is true. 1930s UK. They clubbed together and financed the building of a wall to keep the council tenants away from their community. And it was only in the Second World War when emergency vehicles needed to travel around the community that the wall was removed. Now, can you imagine how excluded and looked down and judged the residents of the, of the Downham Estate felt? And that was a physical wall that's been built. But if we're honest, the social and economic walls that separate communities and leave people feeling judged and downtrodden. And that's why when Jesus came, he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me to bring good news to the poor. Why? Because they need to hear God's wow. They need to hear God's masterpiece. They need to hear their heavenly father celebrating over them. And Jesus wants to do exactly the same over the wall of racism and prejudice. And he wants to tear it down and to say over every group of people, wow. You're incredibly loved by your heavenly father. And over the last couple of weeks, we felt a, a, a stirring of compassion to put our arms as an expression of God's arms around our black community and to say, wow, we never really understood how it felt for you. I've literally had emails of people just offloading their experience over their life as a black person in our local community. And it's literally made me sit at my desk and cry. And it's not just our black community either. It's people from other nations. And I've been shocked. I've uh, uh, awoken to something afresh. And I've thought, this is so much 
uh, away from what the kingdom of God is meant to be or what we're called to create as a church. We're meant to be modeling something different, that every nation, every generation knows that they're embraced, that they're loved. They're part of the kingdom community. And we demonstrate the power of healing and reconciliation together as God's people. You know, in the history of Israel, everyone was given a, uh, an inheritance, a plot of land, And uh, God understood that over time, inequalities would happen because that's what happens. Sometimes tragedy hits people. Sometimes some people are more skilled at prospering than others. And he knew inequality would happen over time. But he said every 50 years, there would be a year of rest. There'd be a year of jubilee. And at the start of that year, a trumpet would sound. And at the start of that year, debts would be cancelled slaves would be set free and everyone would go back to that place that knowing they were equally loved by God and church we need to sound the the jubilee across this land afresh we need to sound the jubilee of God and we need to embrace everyone who's feeling excluded and downtrodden and we need to say you are God's masterpiece and we say wow and we embrace you And we need to put to death hatred. We need to put to death injustice. We need to put to death in um, exclusion because that's what God's called us to be. I was listening to a Mike Todd sermon in the week and he said it is partly a skin issue, but it's not just a skin issue. It's also a sin issue. Because it's jealousy and envy and hatred and unforgiveness and judgmentalism that I've carried in my heart. And that is sin and it makes me lesser than the community that God's called us to be. And I need to put it to death in my heart and we need to put it to death in our heart as God's people. And we need to model something different. There's a famous uh, story in the Bible in Numbers chapter 12, and we normally interpret it as as Miriam speaking against Moses and then ending up uh, as a leper, which is the story in Numbers chapter 12. And we often say, so you mustn't speak against leadership. Now, I'm in leadership, so I welcome any sermons on don't speak against leadership, honour leadership. I think actually it is a godly uh, principle, all jokes aside. It is a godly principle. If we honour leadership, then we put ourselves under the blessing of God and God can bless us. But you know, when you actually look at the context of Numbers chapter 12, it says Miriam criticised Moses because he married a Cushite. And a Cushite was an African woman. And so actually it isn't about honouring leadership. It's the first incident of spoken racism. And the fruit of it is Miriam becomes a leper. Because racism is ugly and it diminishes and it disfigures. And it's against the heart of God. And I think God's got our attention in this season so that we will look into our hearts and into the heart of us as a community of God's people and say, have we really got a heart to embrace? Have we really got a heart to cross the divide? Are we really letting God's spirit work in how we see one another and how we treat one another. And God, give me a new lens. God, reframe my way of seeing so I can see the beauty and the wow in everyone you've given us and give a warm welcome to them. And in Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 17 to 19, Paul goes on and he talks about the welcome that he wants us to have. He talks of Jesus. He says, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. And I love the way the message translation uh, puts it and uh, it puts it slightly differently in contemporary language, but really, really helpfully. So if you put up the message uh, translation slide, Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. The cross got us to embrace. And that was the end of hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. And I talked about in the first half of the chapter, Paul talks about making us alive and 
raising us up and seating us with Christ. In the second half of the chapter, he talks about Jesus bringing peace, bringing reconciliation, and putting to death hostility. And as God's community, we're called to be those who bring the peace of Jesus. We're called to be those who bring the reconciliation of Jesus. And we're called to be those people who put to death hostility. And it starts with us doing that in our hearts. Love where David in Psalms writes, Lord, search my heart, see if there's any wicked way within me. Starts with us rooting out of our lives. And then it starts with us demonstrating a new humanity that loves, values, includes and celebrates all. What we know from what happened on the streets of London yesterday, apart from Jesus, that will not happen. Right wing uh, racists coming to disrupt a peaceful march to try and undermine the cause of the black people in the UK. We will not let that happen. We cannot let that happen because it leaves us being less than who God made us to be. As a community, we need to learn the way of Jesus to be the peacemakers, the peace bringers, the reconcilers, those that put to death hostility and teach a different way. And Paul ends with the last three verses of chapter two, and he talks about church and he calls it God's household, a new family. We're called to be family that love and hold together no matter what. Talks about church being a holy temple. Temple was a place of sacrifice. So we're a community of people who've laid everything down in order that Jesus might be Lord in every part of our lives. And then he talks about the church being the place where God dwells by his spirit. And when we pick up that sense that we are family and we're going to love and value and honour all, that we're going to surrender all at the foot of the cross and we're going to yield to the way that God wants us to live as his new people, as his new humanity, then we can welcome God's spirit and we're set apart from the world. And I think ultimately what will happen is people will look at us and say, how can you do that? Because outside of Christ, it's impossible to. But in Christ... It is totally possible, and it's everything God's called us to. Church, let's pray together, and let's welcome God's Spirit to work in us and bring out that beauty that he's called us to. Lord Jesus, thank you. The truth is that we are all God's masterpieces. And you look at us this morning and you say, wow, you're amazing. And Lord, I pray wherever we're... uh, listening this morning I pray right now we will hear your wow over us and we'll hear your words of love over us but Father I pray we won't just stay in that place Lord I pray that you will help us to see and speak out the wow that you've called us to see and honour in one another and Father we want to stand and take authority over every wall of hostility this morning. And we want to say, you must fall, wall of racism, in Jesus' name. You must fall, wall of exclusion, in Jesus' name. You must fall, walls of injustice, in Jesus' name. And we declare that we are called to be a different community. We're called to be a community that loves and values and honours all. And we're called to be those who put to death hostility and are those that are used to bring peace and reconciliation. And Lord, I pray right now that you will anoint us, Lord, with an anointing by your spirit to be those who can bring healing, to be those who can bring transformation, to be those who can be the agents of change. Lord, it feels like this is a time that the church needs to step forward. This is a time that we need to uh, step, stand up and say, Lord, we're going to live a different way and we're going to teach a different way and we're going to demonstrate a different way. Lord, will you forgive us for we've got it wrong in the past? But I pray, Lord, for a new day 
that we become everything you've called us to be, that we really model the new humanity that you've called us to, that carries your selfless, unconditional love and finds a way of embracing and honouring and celebrating all to the glory of Jesus. Amen.